with Oswald, you get into something altogether different, which is that Oswald uh, had megalomania. He really believed that he was going to be one of the most important people on Earth before he was done. And in the, in the odd, ironic sense, he became very important. Uh, but he saw himself, you know, he read a lot of books on people like Mao, Hitler, Lenin, Castro. He saw himself as a future leader. And he was a theoretician of sorts. I mean, for a young man, he really did a lot of thinking about politics. So that he had, uh, uh, he ended up as a sort of libertarian. You could find a lot of his ideas would uh, be interesting for libertarians today. He believed in, uh, he hated the Soviet Union, he hated the United States. He, he felt that uh, uh, loose associations of people, voluntary associations, were the only way to build society. I think if he had lived until 1969, he would have found a community f waiting for him in Haight-Ashbury. He might have been one of the minor figures in the Haight-Ashbury. He had a lot of lacks because he also had dyslexia and uh, was terribly limited by that. One of the reasons people think that he was an entity is that if you read his letters, they're so, uh, they seem... Uh, illiterate, because he could hardly spell. But if you correct the spelling, what he's saying is often reasonably intelligent and fairly good. In, in fact, uh, we took the trouble to correct something of his that we put in an appendix at the end of the book, uh, which was what he'd written about the Soviet Union. There's about, uh, oh, 10,000 words that he wrote about the Soviet Union that we took from a longer piece, about 25,000 words that's in the Warren Commission uh, exhibits, which is damn good. Uh, you know, it's about the level of a uh, decent uh, newspaper reporter writing about the Soviet Union, which for a kid of 23, 24, who had no formal education, when he was 23 when, when he wrote it, or younger, who had had no formal education and couldn't spell, not bad. So in that sense, he had political concerns, he had social concerns, uh, he was moral that way, but he had almost, there's almost no evidence of spiritual concerns. So I think depending on one's own bent, uh, you, some of you would say Oswald was the more moral because he worried about society, and others would say Gilmore was the more moral because he worried about his soul. But anyway, yes, sir. Despite everything that has been written, millions of words, and everything that has been known, do you think that the real truth about Kennedy assassination will ever come out? The question is, do I think that will the real truth about the Kennedy assassination ever come out? I think it's more likely to come out now, in the next five or ten years, than ever before, because the walls are crumbling. Uh, for instance, the, in my mind, there's very little chance that the uh, CIA or the FBI or any intelligence organization in America uh, was part of a conspiracy to kill the president. Certainly not at the top, with what, what I know about them. This is just my opinion, but it's very hard for me to believe they would have planned it at the top, because you don't get to the top by thinking that way. Uh, you know, you undercut the guy who's competing with you for the job, but you don't shoot up. The, there may well have been huge anxiety in, in the CIA, for example, that some of their people who were terribly disaffected by Kennedy and hated him for having, they felt, betrayed them after the Bay of Pigs when he uh, made an agreement with Castro to stop raids on Cuba thereby cutting off all the anti-Castro Cubans who became immensely disaffected. So there was a lot of fear in the CIA that some of their people, some of their rogue elephants, could have been tied up with uh, uh, anti-Castro Cubans who could have used Oswald in one form or another. There was a lot of fear about that. And they also had some very suspicious stuff in their files, to which there's every reason to believe, as I try to show in the book, that the CIA did learn that Oswald had probably taken a shot at General Walker. They learned it through George de Morenshield, who was a source for them. And what's significant, Edward Epstein discovered that the contact reports that de Morenshield had been giving to his uh, CIA officer, J. Walton Moore, who was domestic contacts division officer in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, that the contact reports for that period of April uh, 1963 were missing. They disappeared from the files. Now, it's possible that one reason they were missing, this is after the assassination, is there are routing reports on, on these files. In other words, if someone in an intelligence organization wants to see a file, 
they have to initial it. In effect, there's a record of who it goes to. So if this file had gone to certain people whom they knew were disaffected, that made everything worse. And they may decide they had to pull that file. That's an extraordinary thing for an intelligence organization to do, to hide a file. They don't do it that casually because it's a huge embarrassment if it's ever discovered. So in that sense, the CIA had a great deal to worry about. The FBI had a great deal to worry about with Oswald because, uh, <clears throat> in my opinion, they were using him for COINTEL Pro. And my reason for it there is simpler, which is just that Oswald, who, who for his age was a political sophisticate, had written a letter on one day to the uh, American Communist Party while he was in New Orleans, and the next day he wrote a letter to the Socialist Workers Party, again, while he was in New Orleans, and he wrote both letters to New York and said in both letters that he was moving east and he'd like to join their party. Now that's like somebody trying to join uh, the Ulster forces in North Ireland and the IRA on successive days. So just think what would happen if the Communist Party and the Socialist Workers Party discovered that the same man was working in both organizations. It would have created chaos in both organizations so it was rather an elegant FBI operation. You know, it was the way to do things. You use one man, you pay him a little bit, he joins both these organizations, you don't have to do a thing, they're going to wreck themselves. Elegant. So, if, that, if they had done that, if they were paying Oswald in any way at all, that would have been a huge embarrassment to the FBI. So I think one of the things that happened, of course, is that there was an enormous cover-up. Because on top of that, there were other fears. The basic fear, for instance, of the CIA was if this goes on, our relations with Gincana and Roselli and trying to assassinate Castro will be found out. Now, in turn, Castro had terrors. He had to wake up in the middle of the night and say to himself, we have people who infiltrate the anti-Castro Cubans in Florida. Some of my best people are now leading some of those organizations. What if the, one of them decided to kill Kennedy on his own with anti-Castro Cubans on the theory that that would blame the anti-Castro Cubans would be good for Cuba. And then what if they find out that in fact the leader of that organization belongs to me, Cuba is destroyed. So the people at the top didn't know what their own people were doing. They never have. You're, not, you're almost not supposed to in an intelligence organization. Present company accepted. <laughs> and uh, therefore there was immense anxiety and huge cover-up. And the Warren Commission became that extraordinary investigative body that found almost no evidence of conspiracy whatsoever. But at the same time, because they had to justify all the huge time and effort that went into it, they gave us a fabulous portrait, if you take the time to read it and find it, of America in 1961, 62, 63, 64. Uh, there are all sorts of marvelous short stories in it. It's, it's a little bit like the... Uh, the Talmud, you know, each, each has 26 volumes. The Talmud has 26 volumes, so does the Warren Report. And they're each filled with fascinating stories en route. But, uh, there the similarity tends to end. But, uh, 